Well, hello, everybody. This is Mace Haroff. I want to welcome you to the Medical Sales Guru Podcast and the Medical Sales Channel. This is a combined podcast and video, so you can listen to this when you're driving to work or working out, or if you want to watch me, and I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, you could watch me on video. No, the reason I do this is because a lot of people go searching for content on YouTube. You may not know this, but YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world, right behind you know who, that's right, Google. So that's why I try to have the content available in both places. But either way, I'm here to talk to you about something that's gonna be important, something that's gonna help you in your territory, in your career. So let's move forward. You're in medical sales, obviously, that's why you're here. Uh, if you're not in medical sales, then you must have a lot of time on your hands. Uh, glad to have you aboard either way. Maybe you want to get into medical sales. Let's talk about your customers. You probably love a lot of your customers. I, I, in fact, I know sales reps who it seems like they're absolutely having a love affair with their customers. In fact, some of them literally have had love affairs with their customers, and I really don't recommend it. It's, it's really not a good thing. Um, did you ever see something and you go, ooh, this, this is not going to end well? I've seen that a lot in the medical sales hospital environment. But the customers that you don't have this wonderful emotional feeling for, I'm talking about the ones that can really be difficult to work with. Now, a lot of you sell to physicians, you might sell to surgeons. Surgeons can really be challenging. In fact, I don't want to pick on surgeons. The, the truth is, the vast majority of surgeons, they're nice people, they're committed to delivering the best outcomes for their patients that they can. But let's face it, if you're going to take somebody to the operating room and you're going to use a knife on them, you better have a sufficiently strong enough ego to believe that you could do a good job. That's why surgeons tend to have large egos. Now, there are surgeons, there are doctors, in fact, there are people in every walk of life who have tremendous egos. They think that the uh, the sky opens and closes on their command, that the world revolves around them. You know the kind of people I'm talking about. And you may have seen these kind of people in your medical sales career. If you haven't, trust me, you will. Or, or you're just not looking, one or the other. There are customers who are difficult to work with. So what do you do? What do you do? I'm going to share a story with you. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very personal story uh, about something that I went through with uh, one of the surgeons in my territory back when I was selling day to day. And here's the thing. We all want the business. That's why we're here. If you're a medical sales professional, your job is to sell. Sell for the right reasons. Sell because you are really providing a benefit for the patients and making it easier for the healthcare provider to benefit those patients. But at the end of the day, you're selling because you want to earn a good income. Commission dollars are really one of the metrics to measure how well we're doing, how many people we're benefiting. If we're getting our products and services into the hands of enough professionals where they can employ it, or into enough institutions where it's going to serve the greater good. Sure, we want those commission dollars, but sometimes you got to ask yourself, at what price do the commission dollars come? If you sell something like high-priced disposables, a uh, high-priced disposable being uh, an orthopedic implant, a spinal implant, vascular implants, you get the gist of what I'm doing. These are high-priced items. You look for the high-volume surgeons, the high-volume institutions, those that do a lot of these procedures because you want to be able to maximize your income. Makes a lot of sense. You know what I'm talking about. So we all target those high-volume surgeons if you sell a surgical device. Well, there was one surgeon in my territory. His name, I'll call him Dr. George. Dr. George. Dr. George was a, a very high, high volume guy. Uh, he probably, his potential to me at the time, and this is going back many years, was probably about a million dollars a year in sales. Million dollars a year in sales. That's a high volume surgeon. I went after that business for years. Now you know that if you're in this industry, 
it oftentimes can take you years to land a high volume user, a high volume surgeon. You got to keep going back. You got to do the right things. You got to deliver value, deliver value, deliver value. And sooner or later, hopefully, your time will come. And this happened to me with Dr. George. In fact, I probably knew him for about eight or 10 years, had been calling on him regularly for about eight or 10 years. I even used to run into him in the gym. You know, sometimes he'd be working out when I'd be working out and socialize with him very mildly. He wasn't an easy guy to get to know, but he was a high volume surgeon. So one day I heard it through the grapevine that the, the company who he was doing his hips and knees with, he was having a lot of trouble with them. He was having problems with the rep. And the people in the operating room shared with me, they said, Mace, I think um, Dr. George is not going to be using the company that he's been using uh, for a while. Um, you might want to stay close to him. This is why you like having those relationships with, with your operating rooms, with your accounts. You don't want to just know the people who could stroke a check or issue a PO or say, yeah, we're going to use this. You want to know everybody because they will provide you with information that could be very, very beneficial. And this was a situation with Dr. George. So I went to see him. And I went to see him just to talk about product. And I also knew a little bit about the products, he, uh, the, excuse me, the problems that he was having with the product he was using. So I started talking about it. And uh, I knew him for a long time. And he's, you know, he's looking at the product. He's going, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, well, um, Mace, why don't you um, bring the instruments by and, uh, you know, uh, You'll, you'll take me through it. I said, I'd be happy to do that because uh, when you're ready to try this, I, I think you'll, you'll like the instruments. He said, what do you mean when I'm ready to try it? He said, I'm ready to try it. Bring the instruments in. I'm going to start booking cases with you. If that's ever happened to you, you know the feeling. It's like, whoa. It's like, ka-ching. You just won the lottery. It's, it's the payoff for what you've been going after for in my case, for years, for you it might be weeks, months, but a lot of times it's years. I just added, potentially added, if everything goes well, a million dollars worth of business to my territory. That's significant. Well, I started doing business with Dr. George and I quickly learned something. He was not an easy guy to work with, some of the time. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. George had some issues. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes he'd be very, very friendly. Other times he would rant and rave on a level that you would not believe. So when you walked into the operating room with him, you never knew what to expect. You didn't know if it was going to be a good day or a bad day. On, on good days, he'd be playing music and the cases would flow smoothly. And in a day, you know, he'd do four, five, six uh, total hips or total knees. I mean, trust me, if you're in the business, those were good days. You know, love those days when he was having a good day. But on those days when he wasn't having a good day, he was mad at the world and he was angry at everybody in the world. I'll never forget an instance where uh, a, a excuse me, a nurse, the circulating nurse who was on his case, uh, she didn't prepare everything the way he liked it. She knew how he, how he liked it, and it, it was pretty close. This day, it was a little bit off. In the middle of the case, he read her the riot act, called her the C word. And, you know, there's five people in the room besides the patient, you know, the anesthesiologist, uh, there's the scrub tech, there's his surgical assistant, uh, who was another surgeon who used to work with him. There was me. He, and she was the nicest, per I'm serious, she was one of the nicest people you ever met in your life. I mean, she, she, she wouldn't say, you know, doo-doo if her life depended on it. She just wouldn't do it. Well, he, he spouted every profanity you could ever imagine at this poor woman where, now she was a professional. She, you know, she had tears running down her face, but she wasn't going to leave the room. But she picked up the phone, she called the supervisor, she said, you get someone in here to replace me. So eventually she was replaced. As it turned out, the doctor, Dr. George, was reported to administration. Guess what administration did? Not a damn thing. Why? Because he was a high volume surgeon. He put a lot of 
patients into this hospital, a lot of profitable patients. Now, keep in mind, when I say the hospital didn't do anything because they were dealing with a surgeon who was very profitable for the hospital, I'm not casting aspersions on the hospital because the hospital really is no different than pretty much all of the sales reps I know, including myself. This guy was never easy to work with. There were times when he would go off on me. And he would do things like this. There, there was a particular time that um, he had asked me if I would send him on a, on a trip. Uh, and when I say on a trip, uh, this, this has changed a lot, but a surgeon used to be able to approach a sales rep and say, you know, I wonder, I'm, I'm going to a, a course, you know, that's, that's taking place at a university. Uh, you know, it's where he was trained. He said, I'd like to go, um, you know, um, it, I, I would like for you to sponsor me for that. So what do you say? I mean, the guy's doing a million dollars worth of business here. You go, yeah, no problem. So he, he goes on the, to the course, course. And, and by the way, if you on the podcast, I just made air quotes. All right. So course, I, n- I didn't know if it was a quote or not, but when a high volume surgeon asked you to send him, you, you would send him. I assumed it was a legitimate course. So he comes back and he gives me the receipts. Uh, the receipts included, you know, a limo to the airport, first class air transportation, uh, deluxe suite at one of the finest hotels in the city that he was in. Uh, he ordered room service, uh, usually for breakfast and lunch, uh, with wine. He'd go out for dinner. He gave me all of the, the invoices. It totaled about $3,000. So, I mean, you know, that's kind of the way business was, one of the ways business was done back then. You, with, with high volume surgeons, you did that. Fortunately, the Department of Justice stepped in and, and advomed and said, you can't do this anymore. It's wrong. And it was wrong, and I hated it, but that's the way business was conducted. Well, lo and behold, I found out, I was talking to one of my competitors and, uh, who, who did some business also with Dr. George. And, and he's telling me about this trip that he just sent the doctor to and it cost him $3,000. You guessed it. It was the same trip. He double dipped. He was collecting money from both. He was making a profit on going to, you know, this course, which I don't really believe it was a course. I believe it was a, a weekend for him and his girlfriend to have fun in this, you know, very exciting American city. Let's leave it at that. But I bit my lip because again, why? High volume surgeon, just like the hospital, I kept my mouth shut. And back at that time, this really, there were no rules against doing this. If you did that today, uh, you'd be in a lot of trouble. The doctor would be in a lot of trouble. It it would violate all kinds of anti-kickback statutes and, and everything else. You just don't ever want to go there. So anyway, here's what happened. Here's what happened. One day I'm uh, in the operating room with him, and, and Dr. George, when he was putting in an acetabular component, which is the, 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 the socket when you're doing a total hip, he didn't believe in the way the designers created the system. He liked to use an undersized drill bit to put in a, a screw, a cancellous screw, because he liked it to be really tight when he was screwing it in. So anyway, he's using this undersized drill bit, and he's trying to put in this screw, and, and it's just not going in. And, and he's struggling with it, and he's struggling with it, and finally, he shears the head off the screw. So now he's got the screw stuck in the pelvis and with no head on it, and he's, he's got to get it out because it, it, it's in the way. Well, he totally loses it, takes the instruments, throws them on the floor, lays into me in the biggest way possible, just showers me with this profanity like you would not believe. Now, I just let it go. I didn't say anything. I'm wearing a surgical mask, so of course he couldn't see the look on my face, but I just kept my mouth shut. The most important thing at that moment was the patient. The patient's on the table. So he has his fit. He starts asking for special instruments, gets the broken screw out. He was able to twist it out with a pair of pliers or vice grips or something. Finished the case. Didn't say anything. I I didn't say anything right away. But at, at the end of the day, I go into the surgical lounge to change, and he's in there. Now, keep in mind, my job as the rep, just as your job as the rep, was to tell him the proper way to use the instruments, to tell them the proper drill bit to use with the screw. Whatever drill bit was required, however it was created, that's what you do. You you basically recite 
the design criteria as it's given to you from your company. I always did that. I was in the clear. Well, you know, he sees me, and again, he lays into me, starts going, you messed up my day. You harmed that patient. If anything happens to that patient, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after your company. And, and I, I just said, Dr. George, I, I said, what is the problem here? You know, the, the surgical protocol specifically requires a 3.2 millimeter drill bit, and you chose to use a 2.7 millimeter drill bit because you like it tight. I said, you know, I don't know how you're holding me responsible. And he laid it to me and, and he continues to curse. He says, you know what? You want my business? You're, you're going to lose my business. You keep this up, you're going to lose my business. And I got to be honest with you. Up until this point, I had his business for a couple of years and I enjoyed it. And it, it was great money. It was great. The days that I had to go into the OR with him, though, I didn't sleep the nights before. I dreaded it. I was worried that I wouldn't have the right instrument, that something was going to go wrong, that he was going to attack me, he was going to attack somebody else. It was just one of those things where it really started to affect the way I felt about life. And here I am in the surgeon's lounge with him, and he's threatening to take it away from me. And, you know, it was just one of those moments where, listen, I don't believe, you know, um, what, what's the saying? I don't believe in, um, you know, like biting off your nose to spite your face. That, that's an old cliche, but I think you understand the gist of it. But we all reach a boiling point. And I said to the doctor, he, when he's, he's threatening, I'm going to take my business away. I'm going to give it to somebody else. If you don't start doing what I asked, if you don't take responsibility for, you know, for what happened today. And I said, you know, Dr. George, um, I can't take responsibility for what happened today because I've told you the proper use of the instruments and the implants. You chose to go in a different direction. I'm willing to do whatever I can to help you help your patients, but I can't be held responsible when you deviate from the surgical protocol. And you know, if you choose to take your business somewhere else because of it, there's nothing I could do about that. But I tell you what I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to you berate me and use profanity with me for something that I didn't do. So if you choose to take your business somewhere else, you know, you go ahead and do that. Um, I'll stop by your office later on this week to uh, check on the patients for next week. If you want to move forward, you let me know. And if not, that's fine too. Have a nice day. And I walked out of there. And of course, I had this dichotomy of, of feelings. You know, on one hand, I finally, calmly and respectfully said what I've been wanting to say for a very long time. And on the other hand, I realized that I pretty much just kissed away a million dollars worth of business. But a very interesting thing happened. That night, when I went to bed, I slept like a baby. I felt a huge sense of of relief. Now, I remember when I shared this story with my manager, and the manager said to me, well, you know, Mace, that, that, that's horrible. You, you just lost a million dollars worth of business. What are you going to do to get it back? What are you going to do? And I said, you know what, Mike? I'm not going to do anything. I don't want it back. I really don't. And, you know, I, I mean, the rest of my territory was solid. I knew I wasn't going to get fired. That wasn't going to happen. I'd been in the territory a long time. I had great numbers. I just said, I don't want him back. I said, here, you know, if you want to send somebody else in, you know, one of the other people in the distributorship and have him or her take over, I said, be my guest. I'll introduce them. I'll, I'll, I'll teach them the ropes. Be happy to go through the whole thing. But you know what? I don't want any part of that guy. So why am I telling you this? Am I telling you this to inspire you to kiss off your customers who are problematic, the ones who don't treat you well? And the answer is no. I, I'm not trying to tell you that because one of the things, uh, I just wrote an article about this, you, you, or, or I podcasted about it. You don't have to have great relationships to do business with your customers. You really don't. It, it's not about the relationship. It's about providing value to your customers so they could provide value to their patients. But here's the thing. You have to be able to live with yourself. And only you can determine if the 
financial end justifies the, the means where someone is abusing you, where they're treating you poorly. And granted, for a long time, listen, you know, I, I let a lot of stuff slide off, but you can only take so much. You're human. And what I learned was, after two years of working with this guy, Dr. George, it was, it was great getting rid of him. I enjoyed the, the business. It was enough. I moved on. And I went after, here's another takeaway for you. You know, when you have a big cutter like Dr. George, and you lose that guy, ouch. I mean, it, you feel it instantly. But here's the thing. My goal after this was to, and I had other high volume surgeons, my goal after this was to replace Dr. George with a lot of uh, low to average volume surgeons. That's what I focused on. Because if you lose one of them, I mean, it hurts. Yeah, it always hurts when you lose business. But the financial impact is minimal. And it's easier to replace a surgeon, for example, who does 15 or 20 cases a year than it is to replace a surgeon who does three or 400. So a little bonus there. Make sure you balance your business with the normal volume surgeons as well as the high volume surgeons. But the main point of this is, yes, you can fire customers who don't treat you well. Customers who interfere with you being able to, number one, feel good about yourself, and number two, do your job effectively. As human beings, we're entitled to, to certain decencies, and you will have customers over the years who cross that. Now, the reality is the vast majority of medical professionals I've worked with who had a bad day, who had an incredibly stressful moment in the operating room, they owned it, and they apologized for it. And it was just, you know, you, you understood their personalities, and it was in the context of what they did. However, some are downright nasty. And the decision is yours, whether you choose to work with them or not. I guess you have to balance it all out. You know, can you afford the financial hit? Can you, uh, will, will your company, will your manager allow you to do that? Uh, one thing I suggest you do is that if you have any problematic customers, make sure it's documented. Make sure that there's clear communication uh, with your management so they know what's going on. But at the end of the day, your goal, again, is to do what's right for that provider and to help him or her to help his or her patients. If that person doesn't appreciate it, if they make your life difficult, if they misuse your products in such a way that it creates liability for them that could be passed on to you, then you have to make some decisions. Covered a lot of ground here today, didn't I? Food for thought. Hope this has been helpful. Some more food for thought. My goal is to provide the audience that I exist for my, my goal is to help them to succeed in a, in a very difficult, in fact, increasingly difficult healthcare environment. Um, I have lots of free articles and videos on my website at medicalsalestraining.com. But this January, I launched something called Medical Sales Academy. And Medical Sales Academy is an online portal. It's a support site. It's like a membership site where you become part of my inner circle. You need help with your medical sales, I'm there for you. There's, um, first of all, there is the same training that, that I bring to, to my corporate customers, uh, which I will sh tell you, uh, they, they pay some uh, serious fees to get, and it's worth it, it's, it's very worth it, because they get a, a multiple return on what I teach if they follow the, you know, the follow-up programs and everything else so that it's implemented into the field and their sales team are using it on a regular basis. In Medical Sales Academy, you as an individual, I can teach you the same information. And this will make a dramatic difference in your territory because I promise you, 96% of the sales reps out there are selling intuitively, they're having product-focused conversations instead of value-focused conversations, and I show you exactly how to change that up and do it. Now, Medical Sales Academy enrollment is not open right now. 
Uh, I, we only have enrollment a few times during the year because we put a lot into it. Uh, I have conversations with you when you come on board about your territory, about what your goals are. So if you'd like to be notified when enrollment for Medical Sales Academy opens again, two ways you can be notified. Go to medicalsalesacademy.com, all one word. Click on more information and at the bottom of that page, you will see a, a box where it'll say, you know, be notif notify me. And you could uh, submit your email and we'll notify you when enrollment opens up. Or you can send a text message. I know a lot of you just like to send a text message. Try to make it easy. Send a text message. I want you to text notify MSA, all one word, N-O-T-I-F-Y MSA. Send that to 44222. In fact, it's right here on the screen if you're watching the video. 44222, notify MSA. And again, thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for uh, allowing me to share with you about Medical Sales Academy, but most importantly, thanks for being a valuable resource to your customers, to the institutions that you serve as a medical sales professional. Because if you do your job well, who benefits? The patient benefits. My friends, nothing in your world of medical sales is more important than the patient. The patient always comes first. You have an opportunity to go out and make a difference. Go out there and do that. I'll talk to you again next week on the Medical Sales Guru podcast and the Medical Sales Channel. I'm Mace Haroff. Bye for now.